The second step in urine formation is reabsorption. During reabsorption, water and solids in the filtrate are returned back to the blood in the peritubular capillary. About 99% of the filtrate is returned back to the blood during reabsorption. That includes most of the water, all of your nutrients such as glucose, amino acids, most of your electrolytes, small proteins that may have been filtered, and bicarbonate ions. The amount of bicarbonate ions reabsorbed will be dependent upon the blood pH. Reabsorption involves osmosis and also transport proteins. When transport proteins are involved, you can reach what is called transport maximum. Most of the reabsorption is going to occur in the proximal convoluted tubule. About 65% of the filtrate is reabsorbed here. Let's go back to the transport maximum. When you are using transport proteins, the solids bind to binding sites on the proteins. When all binding sites are occupied, the carriers have reached transport maximum. Any additional solids, solids that are unable to bind to the binding sites, will remain in the filtrate and become part of the urine. This is seen during uncontrolled diabetes mellitus. The glucose that is not able to be reabsorbed ends up being in the urine, and that condition is glycosuria. Let's continue with reabsorption. In the previous slide, I mentioned that 65% of the filtrate is reabsorbed in the proximal convoluted tubule. Now let's look at what happens in the loop of Henle. Recall that the loop of Henle has two limbs, a descending limb and an ascending limb. The descending limb of the loop of Henle is permeable to water because of the presence of pores called aquaporins. These are proteins that are for water. The descending limb is impermeable to solids, so water is allowed to leave, but solids cannot follow. The story is different in the ascending limb. Within the ascending limb, solids can leave, so it is permeable to solids, but water cannot leave. There are no aquaporins present. Reabsorption occurring in the distal convoluted tubules in the collecting ducts involves specialized cells. Principal cells have receptors for hormones, and these are involved in salt and water balance. The receptors for these hormones include the receptors for ADH, antidiuretic hormone, which will increase water reabsorption, and the receptors for aldosterone, which will increase sodium reabsorption and potassium secretion. A second type of cell will be called the intercalated cells, and these cells are involved in acid-base balance, regulating hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions in the blood. Let's take a closer look at those principal cells. Principal cells that have receptors for ADH, antidiuretic hormone, are located within the collecting ducts. When ADH binds to these receptors, it triggers the cells to place aquaporins on their membrane. This allows water to move across the aquaporins by way of osmosis. Principal cells that have receptors to aldosterone are located within the distal convoluted tubule in the collecting ducts. In response to the aldosterone, these cells place protein carriers for sodium and potassium. Sodium is reabsorbed and potassium is secreted. In response to elevated blood pressure, the atria of the heart release ANH or atronotiuretic hormone. This inhibits aldosterone, thus inhibiting sodium reabsorption. PTH released by the parathyroid hormones 
binds to principal cells located primarily in the distal convoluted tubule. Once it binds to its receptor, PTH increases calcium reabsorption at the kidneys.